1730 hours on April 4th, 2004, Sadr City of Baghdad, Iraq. Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar. First platoon, Charlie 25 Cav, was escorting a sewage truck in the southern part of the city. Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar. 17.55 hours as the sun began to set. Three large groups of men scattered to the north as the patrol approached. Everyone in the patrol began to scan their sectors. The city of over two million people grew eerily quiet. And then... What started as sporadic gunfire quickly became overwhelming from all directions. Enemy forces across the city called to arms by the echoing calls of prayer, bouncing from one minaret to the next. This sparked a chain reaction that threw the 1st Brigade Combat Team, 1st Cav Division, headlong into the battle we now call Black Sunday. I am your host, Eddie Lazary, and on this series of episodes, I will be talking to the troops who were there and their families. We will be following and discussing The Long Road Home, a seven-part miniseries in the National Geographic Channel. If you or someone you know served during the Battle of Sadr City, I want to talk to you. Join us over to our closed Facebook group, 04-04-04. Now let's meet our next guest. You know, I want to talk about what we're going through, but I also want to be able to have, you know, somebody to to explain it, I guess. This is Sylvia Macias, the mother of Robert Arciaga, her oldest son, who was in the army and died in Iraq on April 4th, 2004. Sylvia is also the mother of Jeremy Arciaga, her youngest son who was in the Marine Corps and died to suicide on September 4th, 2015. This is her story. He was the oldest of the boys because yeah. I have four children. And uh, my daughter, she's the oldest. And all four of my children served in the military. Angel was in the Army. Uh, so was Robert. And then my two uh, younger ones, which is Gilbert, he went to Iraq in 03. He's a Marine. And then Jeremy, my youngest, he went to Iraq in 08, and he's also a Marine. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, first, I just got to say thank you for raising children that want to serve this country. Um, it's it's awesome. I mean, you get a lot of families out there that, that have multiple children, maybe one or two, but very few, very few times you'll see an entire family serving no. <laughs> Does military service kind of run in your family, or was it, or what was the? I found out after everybody joined that there was quite a few uh, family members that were in the military, and you know, including my dad and a couple of uncles and brothers. Uh, but it wasn't something that we talked about. You know, we didn't sit at the table talking about, you know, that that was their dream to join. It was my daughter who was the first one after she uh, graduated high school. She she went to the recruiter, and they got her, and they, she called me from there to, 
tell me how excited she was to to have joined and all I could do was cry because I didn't think that was a place for a young lady and so I worried about her and we went to go see her graduate from boot camp and then after that all the boys decided to to join right after but it wasn't something that we talked about yeah it just kind of how how did you feel about that one right after the other your, your all your children joined the military it was uh it was kind of crazy because uh, like i said it wasn't something that that we talked about and then for all of them to to do it you know i i questioned them you know like do you know that if we go to war, there's a possibility that you guys would go. And all of them said they knew that. And that if that's what, you know, was going to happen, that they'd be ready for it. To have one child join the military during a time of war would be hard enough. But to have all four, one daughter and three sons, two would join the Army, two the Marine Corps, all making a difference. And, and your son, Robert... He was with uh, with me. I was there, 1st Brigade Combat Team, 1st Cav Division. And uh, we, we weren't in country for very long. We were only uh, really in Baghdad for a few days when all of this went down. Um, yeah. I can't imagine what you were going through to have your oldest son deploy to what was supposed to be basically a peacekeeping mission. Um, but he kept telling me, yeah, I just, you know, I just can't imagine that just, and I, I know that you talk with, uh, with Janet, uh, Johnson, who is the mother of the, of my soldier that was killed on April 10th. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and that was just a couple of days and I just couldn't believe that we were losing guys, um, I mean, we joined the military. We we know kind of what we're getting into, and we knew where we were going, and and you know ultimately knew what could happen. But it's just the reality was just I don't think anybody was ready for it. You know? Yeah, you're right. I mean, I know that even though I had asked them that, it wasn't something that I ever thought would happen to us. You know. Um, Losing my son was so hard, and I've always been curious once I found out what happened. Um, I wanted to know what he went through, you know, and I asked a bunch of the the guys that would talk to me about it, you know, if they would tell me what happened that day, and I've had a few that did and a few that were shocked that I wanted to know what he went through, and yeah, I... It, it's been a really hard journey. So what was your reaction when you found out they were making uh, a movie about it or a, a miniseries on the National Geographic? Well, I, I was really excited about it, and especially the way um, Miko, the, pr the producer, explained it to us, you know, because I had always wanted that story to be out. When, when we lost Robert, you know, it was couple of days after we buried him that I had this vision that it would be a movie and I just kind of blew it out of my head I was like no nah, that's crazy so how could you even think that you know why would they make a movie of Robert my son and then Martha's book came out we didn't get a chance to talk to her uh when she was writing the book but when it came out you know Robert was mentioned in it and I read everything that everybody went through in the in the book and it, it was it was amazing that that it wasn't as bad as it could have been even losing my son it could have been worse and then when Miko came to talk to us about it and he was telling us you know he wanted to do the story of the the ordinary soldier I thought that's my son he was an ordinary soldier and I was so excited that they were going to do that, the the series about all of you guys. Yeah, and that's and that's kind of the the thing about. And I think I mentioned this on one of the other podcasts that I've done on this series with some of the other guys. Is 
what makes the long road home, I think, a lot different than a lot of other, you know, um, war movies based on actual events is, you know, a lot of the movies that have come out, you know, prior to the long road home is, you know, movies about, you know, special forces and, and, uh, right. and, um, Navy SEALs and all these spec op, ops guys. And, and I was telling, I was like, you know, we were, you know, we were regular soldiers. We, you know, I mean, we were, we were trained. Yes. But I mean, you know, we, we were cooks, we were, you know, artillerymen, we were engineers, we were, uh, you know, uh, mechanized infantry right. and, and cavalry and, and drivers. I mean, mechanics were out on these uh, rescue missions. And, you know, we're just the regular Joes out there um, doing whatever we can uh, to save our brothers that are pinned down in, in this unfamiliar world in this. I mean, culture shock's not even a way to describe I mean even 12 months in in country you, you, you never really get used to it but being only there only for a few days it was just everything was so different the the the, the, yeah. the people the the cars the buildings the language um just everything about being over there was just completely foreign and it really kind of took you out of your comfort zone and and you just relied on your training and you you trusted in your leadership and you just did whatever you had to do. And that day, you know, the, the, a lot of people, that, you know, they use that that term that uh, uncommon valor uh, was was common that day. And, and it might be a little cliche, but it was absolutely true. Everybody pitched in and did everything they could. And that's what I'm getting out of this series is what everybody's part was on that day. Because when we found out about Robert... All we knew or wanted to know about at that point was what happened to him. Mm -hmm. We didn't know about the the guys that were ambushed, you know, how how hard they had it and the other guys that tried to go in there and rescue. It was, you know, it was just Robert that I worried about. But this this series is giving me all that. And and we're at the time of, of us recording this right now, we haven't watched the episode um I think that's coming this week, the episode of the rescue team that went in that your son was a part of that was that where he was killed. Um, have you seen that? I don't know how much the, the family members of the series. Uh, I know you, you guys went to the premiere or had the opportunity to go to the premiere there at Fort Hood, I think it was. Yeah. How was that kind of getting together with the other family members? You know, I keep hearing this this um this thing you know that it's been healing for a lot of a lot of the soldiers that were there and um i've gone to a bunch of memorials and you know where they honor all the guys and being there at fort hood and watching everybody talking to each other you know I, i've been wanting to meet milton Berger for the longest time and i don't know why he he I wanted to meet him, but I got to meet him at Fort Hood, and he was so quiet, didn't say much at all, but he didn't have to. I was just so glad to meet him, and I thought, man, that's crazy. I would have never met him if it wasn't for this series, and I've gotten to to see my family smile and enjoy being around these guys, and I thought, you know what? It's it's a good this is a good series. This is going to bring a lot of people together, and it has already. So I know a lot of guys that I talk with say that this series has been a way for them to have a way to open up and to talk and to express feelings and reconnect um, and, and to heal. And I, I can't help but wonder about, you know, the family members of those that, that were lost, if it has the same effect or if it doesn't, you know? And it has for me, it really has. It really has brought some sort of peace, you know, with the loss of Robert. But, you know, I've, I don't know if this is a good time to bring it in, but, you know, I have another journey mm -hmm. that I've got to, to get through, and it's losing my youngest one. This journey of losing her youngest son, Jeremy, this story would prove to be a difficult one.
U.S. Marine Sergeant Jeremy Arciaga, 31, took his own life on September 4, 2015. His older brother Robert's death had a profound impact on the entire family, and probably even more so for Jeremy, who was known for following in his brother's footsteps. Well, when we first, when uh, Jeremy, my youngest, first took his life, I was, I had so many mixed emotions, and it was like back to back. It wasn't like days later, but it was like instantly. I was angry at him. I was ashamed of him. I was, I didn't know how I would honor him when, you know, the same way I would honor Robert and and then all of a sudden, I just thought, you know what? He, he's my hero too. The pain that he's that he um, was suffering with, he's not suffering anymore. But what I want to what I want to talk about is what he left behind. You know, he left behind a wife, four boys. He left his mom, his brothers, and his sisters, and I, I understand, I, I always understood his desperation, but the devastation that somebody, when somebody makes that choice, the devastation it leaves behind, it's hard. I know that when you we first talked on the phone about about your story, one of the things that that you you shared with me was some of the guilt that you felt about talking and honoring Robert for his sacrifice on April fourth, and the guilt that you you had for not feeling able to honor you, Jeremy. And, and I, and I told you that, that both your sons, Robert and Jeremy, they, they both died in battle, uh, but they were just on different battlefields. Do you know? Yes. Yes. I do remember that. And that's the perfect way to put it. You're right. And and Dwayne's got some. I'm gonna bring Dwayne here a little bit. He he's got some experience with this as well in terms of, um, you know, siblings and and parents losing uh, uh, children to to suicide, in particular veterans, and the the emotions that you expressed earlier of uh, being so diverse and, and conflicting. You've got the, you know, the sadness and the anger and 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 you know, the, the shame and all of that. And sometimes they come in different waves. Sometimes they're all present simultaneously almost. Right. Yes. And, you know, I, I, I would like to ask Dwayne kind of, I mean, those feelings that, that Sylvia is feeling, that's, that's not abnormal. Those are very commonplace. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is, uh, this, like you said, um, on this day, you know, uh, uncommon valor was common. And this is Dwayne France, host of Headspace and Timing, a podcast designed to breaking down the stereotypes of veteran mental health. Dwayne is a licensed clinical mental health counselor dedicated to veteran mental health. I've asked Dwayne on this interview to help Sylvia share her story. And, and for anyone to lose uh, two sons in any manner, um, would be significant, but this is, uh, this is particularly challenging and, and, and we have to figure out how to come to terms with this. I, I know, uh, and Sylvia and I had, uh, uh connected a little bit after and, and talked some about this, but, uh, this is a very similar situation to, um, uh, one that, uh, a major general Mark Graham, who was, uh, my, uh, commanding general here at Fort Carson, uh, when I first got here in 06, uh, he and his wife Carol had lost uh, two sons uh, in in much the same way. Um, Kevin, who was a, a cadet uh, in ROTC, had taken his own life, uh, and then Jeff, his brother, uh, died of an IED uh, in Iraq about six or 
uh, nine months later, I think. And, and, and that's something that General Graham and his wife Carol often talk about is the difference between uh, how the response was um, to, to Kevin's death versus uh, Jeff's death. Um, that uh, when, when Jeff died, everyone hailed him as a hero. Uh, but then when Kevin, um, or, or when Kevin died and, and died first, um, you know, everybody, they were met with silence. They were met with, um, you know, nobody knew what to say to them. Uh, but then, uh, you know, Jeff's memorial was filled and packed with throngs. And they thought, you know, I honored both of my sons the same way. Uh, the beautiful part, I think, about uh, Sylvia's story is that that didn't happen with Jeremy and Robert, did it, Sylvia? You had no. you had a, a lot of support with with both of your sons. I really did. I mean, uh, with Jeremy, we had the Patriot Guards, we had the VFW, I had my Gold Star families that that lived there in the area. Uh, we there was uh, his church. His church was there. Uh, the people that he worked with were there. They were all there to honor my son. And I don't know if if it's strange to say, but it was just as beautiful as Robert's. And I think that's a that's a big indicator um, of how recognized uh, the the challenge is now is is when uh, when when Jeremy. Uh, when his service occurred in 2015, people recognized what you recognized, Eddie, that uh, that this was something that these were simple, uh, simply casualties on different battlefields. Um, obviously, when the Grams went through theirs, it was much earlier, probably 10 years earlier or even before that. Um, and, and it does go to show that uh, the nation uh, communities are recognizing um, uh, this epidemic of veteran suicide in a very different way. Yes. So I think, and part of the story, Sylvia, that, that that you would like to share, that you're sharing tonight, is is kind of the st story that a lot of people don't talk about, and that is the the story after. Right. right. We often we often talk about veteran suicide in the 22 a day and and the the causes of veteran suicide and 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 the preventive measures and how to seek help and what to do and you know, check your buddy and all of these things. But one thing that kind of really gets missed in all of that conversation is the wake of destruction that's left uh, in the path of an event like that. Right. right. And, that, and that's what I want to, uh, I want to point out is, you know, I, when somebody makes that decision to take their own life, you know, I understand they're they're at that point where they don't have any any other way, and I believe that's where my son was at. Um, what's left behind is is the family that has to to deal with the loss and and missing them and wondering, you know, what could we have done, how could we have done it different, and the pain that they had was is passed down to us you know and i talked my son jeremy had four sons his oldest he was 16 at that at that time when jeremy took his life and this is i guess the chain reaction of of that my grandson was in such pain after losing his dad that he attempted suicide but I, I just happened to be at the right place at the right time at that moment, and I saved my grandson. But it's just passed on. And I, I don't even know how to. I'm sorry, guys. No, you're 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 saying it exactly uh, as it is, Sylvia. This is uh, this is what we see. You know, a, a lot of people uh, consider suicide. Uh, as an attempt to stop pain, uh, and you mentioned that a couple times with Jeremy, and, and there's different kinds of pain: physical pain, um, uh, uh, you know, emotional pain, of course, uh, spiritual pain. Maybe they're, they're, they feel guilty about something, but many different um, uh, types of pain. And and so, in many ways, uh, a veteran or, or anyone who is contemplating this would consider it 
as a way to stop the pain. Um, but as I told my veterans, the, the pain uh, doesn't last forever. Pain does go away. There's ways to make it go away, but the suicide does. Uh, but a very prominent um, a suicide researcher has said that um, it, it doesn't even relieve the pain. It just spreads the pain around. Um, and that's exactly yep. what you're talking about is the pain. Um, <laughs> the pain is, is, is like a virus that just jumps from host to host in many ways. Uh, exactly. And so um, uh, someone contemplating taking their own life, they're, they're an end to their pain. Um, but afterwards, they wouldn't realize the level of pain that is, um, that is caused. Uh, and then what you said about your grandson, it, it does become cyclical. So um, after uh, we, we talk about it in the mental health field is postvention. So we have intervention where we have to stop someone. We have uh, prevention, which is uh, we're trying to keep it from happening. But mm-hmm. after someone um, takes their own life, dies by suicide, or even after an attempt um, that, uh, that doesn't end in death, uh, then we have to start all over again with prevention. And usually uh, after a completed suicide, the prevention first has to go to um, the surviving families. Um, and the survivors of the fallen um, often uh, feel themselves and they, and they question much as you questioned and, and guilt and, and, and they feel these things. Uh, and so after, uh, after a veteran or after anyone takes their own life, it's a very critical time. Uh, for those that are closest to them, uh, that they're in a vulnerable place. Yes. And, and that's what happened with my grandson. I mean, he just felt the loss so bad that he wanted to uh, take that pain away. And, you know, it just, this is a hard journey. It's even, I mean, I, losing Robert was hard. This is even harder. But I just want to let anybody that has that thought in their in their head about taking their own life, there's somebody that loves you. Somebody that's going to miss you. And finds it hard to be without you. Think about it before you do it. And I think that's a that's a significant message. Um, that, that a lot of veterans don't believe, I guess, in that moment. Uh, I, I often describe it as, um, you know, they're down in the bottom of this well and, and they don't see beyond this, this, this very real moment um, of danger for them, but they, the, the consequences aren't there. Um, that at that moment, um, not that they don't want to, not that they don't care, um, but that uh, they just don't see beyond just this very, what they seem to, to feel is unbearable pain. The, the challenge with, um, you know, we never know. I mean, even uh, if someone were to leave a note or, or what have you, we never truly know what it is um, that is uh, going through someone's mind um, at, uh, at that moment where they decide to take their own life. Uh, but, uh, but usually we see that it's, it's a matter of time. So as, as long as is uh, someone can get space in between that urge uh, and then and then taking that action, whether it first be 10 minutes or 20 minutes or 30 minutes. Um, and, and, and like you said, just to reach out to somebody and an hour turns into two hours or four hours. And usually uh, within the next day, um, the danger is passed. It doesn't mean that, you know, we're totally out of the woods and um, you shouldn't uh, uh, speak to a, a counselor or a therapist. But all right. Uh, but it's, but it's a matter of at that very critical moment when a veteran should, uh, and I use that word um, sparingly, but should reach out um, is, is sometimes the time where they may less likely be less likely to reach out. Uh, and it's the time that they need to the most. Yeah. And, and, and Sylvia, I know then, and, and, and I'm sure Dwayne knows this full well as well, uh, and a lot of military service members, whether they're currently serving veterans or otherwise, there's almost a, a, a stigma, right, or a perceived stigma. Maybe maybe the stigma isn't real, but it's just the perceived stigma of seeking mental health um, is is a negative, uh, you know, thing, right? It's it means that they can't 
you know, handle themselves, that they can't um, manage their own feelings or their own emotions, uh, or, or, or it's an it's a, a, an admittance to not being able to, and and that's uh, puts you in a place of of uh, vulnerability and, and weak and perceived weakness, right? right? Um, and and that's one of the things that that Dwayne is working really hard, and 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 myself, and the work that we do is to is to do everything we can to try to break down the stigma of seeking veteran mental health and making it something that's that's uh, not taboo, that it's easy to talk about and and, and and it's it's accepted and and you know and and I think these conversations that we're having with you and you sharing your story is a step in that direction um, to let people know that hey, you know, seeking veteran mental health, talking to somebody uh, about what you're going through, about your feelings, is not a bad thing. Um, it doesn't make you crazy. It doesn't make you weak. It doesn't make you, um, you know, unstable. It, it it makes, it just, I mean, if you break an arm, where do you go? You go to, you know, uh, a, a doctor to, to get it set and put screws in if that's, if, if that's what's needed. And you put a cast on it. And then when you're, when you're done, you take the cast off and you go to physical therapy and you, you know, because your muscles have atrophied, right. And you you go and you work them out and get back in the shape. I mean, that's, you know, mental health is really no different. Um, we, we can injure our, our psyche. We can injure our, um, you know, our emotions, our spirit, our whatever. And, and, Seeking veteran mental health, not even veteran mental health, just mental health in general, from a from a clinician that knows what they're doing, can really help us kind of figure out a lot of these feelings. And I think you you kind of asked the question at the top of the show was you know you're really curious about you know understanding why things like this happen. Yes, right? yes. I, I I mean with Robert, I wanted to know everything that he went through. You know, and and I know, I know what Jeremy went through, and I'm just hoping that with our story, that we were able to help somebody, you know, get past that and get help, and and maybe the family members know, hey, you gotta go check up on them, or you know, call them, or because. If I wouldn't have done that for my grandson, I might have lost him too. But I mm-hmm. I wasn't able to help Jeremy. Now, is your, is your grandkids are they are they talking to somebody now? Are they able to kind of uh, seek some help for a lot of the stuff that they're going through? Well, I know him. He was uh, seeing a therapist. Um, he's doing pretty good now. You know, it's been two years since we've lost Jeremy. And, you know, he, he completed high school. He's in college right now, doing really well. Uh, number two grand, uh, number two son, um, he's 13. He, he, he kind of keeps it to himself. He doesn't really like to talk about it. He doesn't want to go to the cemetery uh, to see Jeremy. Um, As Sylvia describes the third youngest son who is eight or nine now. Doesn't really comprehend what's happened. And then there's Jeremy's youngest son, who was three now. Not even a year when Jeremy took his life. So he doesn't even know his dad. And that's, that's kind of hard to see. Um, When you show, show him a picture of his dad and tell him, look, this is your dad. And he, he tells you, I have a dad. And that's so painful to know that this little boy is not going to know him. So, um, and that's that's I think important to point out too is the the wake of of pain that suicide causes um, is it's far reaching, right? I mean, there's no way to put a time limit on. There isn't, it. Um, it, it, and we don't know how it and it impacts everybody differently, right? That that's a, a funny thing because one of my gold star families we became really good friends and when they found out about Jeremy they came to the house and the husband he was sitting there you know just 
so willing to help out, wanted to know what he could do. And, you know, uh, and then my daughter-in-law came into the house with the babies. And when he saw her, he broke down and he had to leave. He told me the story later. He said that his dad had committed suicide 40 years ago. And watching my daughter-in-law come in with her babies, that took him back to that day. 40 years later, it still impacted this man. It doesn't end. Uh, that is a, a critical thing um, a, about uh, suicide. And, and, it, and it is unfortunately much more common than, than most people um, you know, uh, think or feel. I, uh, many veterans, uh, myself included, have now lost um, more uh, of our brothers and sisters uh, to suicide than we did uh, on the battlefield, um, and, and we we lost a lot of them. Um, and it and it takes a long time maybe for it to happen, um, but then the um, the the echoes occur uh, even longer beyond that. Um, and and it's again, it's not something, and not not whether or not the the veteran should or should not, but it's just it's not something that they consider at that moment at that time, um, or even you know as some may say, um, even if they do consider it, you know they'd be better off without me, and and it's just this this false belief, um, this this false thought uh, that uh, that this is the way that it has to end, um, and it doesn't. And that, and that's true. I mean, they I I really believe they feel like, you know, that we would be better off without them. But we're not. Now all we have to all we can do now, is move on. You know, I heard that a lot when I lost Robert. You know, in time you'll move on. You know, and it would make me so angry to hear that. But now I understand that the moment that you lose somebody from that moment, you're already moving on and we just got to keep going. And I'm hoping that our story will, will open up some eyes and, and help somebody. Absolutely. And I, and I think too, that what's, what's a, what's dangerous, I think for the, for those of us that survive something like that is, sometimes we can get so caught up in uh, like I think I shared with this um with you Sylvia when we talked on the phone um I was a I was a senior, I was a squad leader in Iraq and I and uh, I lost um, Justin Johnson on on the 10th of April um and like we were only there for a week and and I, I still struggle with that because I was responsible for him and he was my guy. I mean, I get it. We were in, we were in war. We were in Baghdad. You know, things weren't, were definitely not peaceful. I mean, we, we were, you know, going through a lot of stuff over there. Everybody was. Um, and so a lot of people kind of look at me and say, eh, you know, you, you shouldn't wear that on your shoulders. You shouldn't, you know, feel bad about it. And I, and I understand that. That makes sense in my head. Yeah. But I can't get my I can't get my heart to agree with my head, right? Because right. because there's there's like there's logic sense, and then there's like emotional, you know, my my spirit and my gut and and the way I actually feel about it, and I can't get by it. And one of the things that still that I still struggle with is is I play I play games with this thing called what if, right? right? What if what if I had done this? What if we had done that? What if we had done more training. What if we were five minutes later that night on patrol? What if the order of the trucks were different? What if, I mean, we just go down this road of playing what if, and it's a dangerous place to be. I've gone down that rabbit hole many, many times. And now I'm, I'm at the point, you know, what, 13 years later where I can sense myself going down that what if rabbit hole and I'm able to recognize it. And kind of pull myself back a little bit, and and uh, and I'm okay. I still allow myself to feel those emotions. I've I've learned not to um, suppress them like I used to, and kind of compartmentalize them because that really that just made things worse. 
Um, but, uh, you know, losing a soldier or losing a son, whether it's to combat or suicide, loss is loss, right? right? And we, we oftentimes struggle with these, the, the guilt around that loss and wondering if, if you had done something different, if, if the outcome would be different. And, and, and I know, Dwayne, I'm sure you can probably talk about this as well and, and with the veterans that you work with. Um, there, there's a lot of that that, that the survivors kind of deal with. I mean, it, is there a way to negotiate that and make that um, less painful? Well, it's, it's really about what you, uh, what you did, what you tell yourself. It's, it's first being aware that that's what you're feeling um, and, uh, and then determining the accuracy of that. Um, uh, I, I believe um, I told Sylvia this when we talked, and, and I don't think we, Eddie, you and I talked about this, but um, uh, last year in a veteran uh, that I'm, uh, that was in a program that I'm affiliated with, um, had died by suicide. Uh, it wasn't a veteran that I was working with. Uh, and my first immediate thought was, um, if I was working with him, you know, what could I have done if, if he was one of my clients, if he was one of my veterans, um, would he still be alive? Uh, and then I immediately caught myself because I know the clinician he was working with. And I know that she was a, a, a dedicated, um, a competent individual, um, she, you know, she, me better where she had actually been doing this, uh, longer than she was a doctor. She had a PhD and, you know, I'm a master's level clinician. And so I'm like, all these different things was, um, he was, he was even in treatment and at the very moment where, um, he was vulnerable, um, he decided to take his own life. And, and so it's these, these thoughts are very common and, uh, with that thought we can't control, it's the next thought that comes after it to say, but yes, I did do everything that I could. And that's, that's essentially arguing with yourself, repeating yourself. And, uh, in, until your heart does believe, yes, I, I did do everything that I could. Um, it, what, what we humans, I guess, uh, human nature is we don't like to, uh, sometimes accept that we have limitations and the limitation is, is, uh, is that, uh, uh, we can't be everywhere at once, and we, we're not all powerful. Uh, and uh, and it's simply doing what you said is just recognizing that thought and saying, you know what, today I'm not going down that rabbit hole. Well, mm-hmm. um, after losing Robert, you know, I spent 13 years living in depression. I I couldn't get myself out of it. I couldn't. I even thought about taking my own life. That's how come I understand the desperation. And, you know, I attempted suicide when I was 15. I understood the desperation. And I don't know if this makes any sense. But when I lost Jeremy, it was a wake-up call for me. I wasted 13 years living that way. And I missed I missed it. I, I couldn't help my son because I was I was in depression so I my what I'm working on now and it's hard every day it's hard but what I'm working on now is not to live my life that way because I've got two other kids that are depending on me and I've got grandbabies that depend on me and I refuse to go down that road again I am gonna survive this and I am. I'm gonna get through it. You know, there's a uh, there's a concept, Sylvia. Um, it's uh, it's sort of the mirror image of uh, you know uh, post traumatic stress disorder or uh, post traumatic decline. That that when something traumatic happens, that uh, you know that uh, that sends us to a downward spiral. Uh, and it's the concept of post traumatic growth. That after uh, something traumatic happens, um, we learn uh, we learn our strength, we learn our capacity, uh, we learn our ability to withstand um, these uh, these horrible uh, emotions. Uh, we learn um, much like uh, going to the gym and and breaking down muscle and building it back up. Um, we can do that emotionally, and you know everybody uh, brings out. Uh, Nietzsche, you know, whatever doesn't kill me makes me stronger. But 
but in many ways, these kind of things do make us stronger. Um, they make us stronger emotionally and psychologically. And, um, and, and just, as you said, the resilience to say, I am not going to allow this to beat me. This, this will not be a thing, um, that, uh, that takes me down. That's good. That's, that's what I'm working on now. You know, and too, Sylvia, I think that, um, I think that the greatest thing that you can do for yourself and for those around you and your loved ones is to do exactly what you're doing right now. And that's talking about it, uh, being open about it, um, you know, putting it in a closet and pretending like it didn't happen or it it doesn't exist. Um, pretending like those feelings and emotions aren't there when you know they really are looking at the grandbabies and when they ask questions, you know, it's tough, it's hard, but I think the way through it is to continue to talk about it and make it so, you know, suicide has to be something that everyone understands how it how it can get to that point and then also understand how do you how do you move past it and what do you do, you know, after something like that happens, right? right. I mean we like, like, like we already said, we do a lot of talking about how to prevent it and then what happens when it happens, but, but how do we survive it, yeah. right? And I think your message is incredibly powerful because it's a one, it's a, it's a message of survival. Um, you are, you're a survivor and, you know, you're not, you, you've got to, you've got to be strong enough for yourself, but now you've also bear a little bit of the strength for those around you and, and I think you're the the the, the monarch, right, of the uh, of the family, and uh, the beacon of light that, that that needs to shine and and show everybody the way by leading by example and talking about it like you are uh, right now is is the way you set that example and is the way that you show other people how they can too. That's exactly what I want. Yeah, and. I, I'll tell you, I mean, at, like at first, when this first happened, I, w- I was, did not want to talk about it. I was, you know, I, the, my other children, Gilbert and, and Angel, I mean, they, they got on it right away and talking to the media and, and talking to whoever would listen. And, and then, then I realized, you know what, I've got to do something with this. I, I just can't keep on living the way that I was depressed and I I thought all my kids were okay I thought if anything happened to me they'd be okay and I was wrong so now I you know I, I gotta do it different well I just gotta say I just gotta thank you Sylvia for for approaching me with this I know this is not easy um, but it's important work that you're doing it's an important message it's gonna it's gonna reach many many people, and I know it's gonna make a difference, and and that's really all we can do, right? Is 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 to take whatever circumstances happen in our lives, some we can control, others we can't, but accepting all of them nonetheless, and saying what can I do with this situation or the circumstance, um, to make a positive impact on others, and, and you're definitely doing that. And I just gotta say. Thank you for your courage, and thank you for uh, your willingness. I don't. I, I'm not going to sit here and say that it gets. It'll get easier with time because I. I don't know. I. I I'm not. I've. You know. I'm, I haven't been in your shoes, so I don't know. Um, if if time heals, I don't know. Maybe it does. Maybe it doesn't. I'm still struggling with the loss of my soldiers, and but they weren't my children. I can't even imagine. Right. Right. Um, <laughs> I just I would just tell you that there's a lot of uh of people out there that uh that love you like family and um we've never met but I can tell you that you know I could easily call you mom and so you have a lot of you have a lot of children uh in and around you whether whether you know it or not and um if there's anything that any of us can do uh to help you and in your family um by all means you know, just please reach out and let let us know. 
Uh, thanks for coming on the show and sharing and sharing your story with everyone that's going to listen to this. I do want to end it with, you know, uh, I told you about my old star family friends. Uh, one of them, mm-hmm. uh, her name is Denise Garza. We became really close. She lost her son in Afghanistan in 05. And we talk a lot, you know, at night and or in the mornings when we get up early and can't sleep. But she made a comment to me the other day that makes so much sense. She said, if, if sharing my story can help save somebody and stop another mom from going to the cemetery, I mean, I did my job. That's what I want to do. Because mm-hmm. it's hard going to the cemetery. It's so hard. Uh, And I'm sorry, guys. I cried through the whole thing. I didn't mean to. (laughs) (laughs) It's okay. And Uh, you're going to be able to edit it, right? All of it, yes. (laughs) (laughs) No, um, there's no way you can talk about, about a subject like this, it being so close to you. I mean, they're they're your 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 children. I mean, I've got two children. I have a son and a daughter, um, and I I know I know what it is to love your kids and to want nothing but the best for them. Um, and so I know I know what I know what that is. So uh, I perfectly understand the emotion that you're feeling in telling the story. Um, and don't don't ever apologize for that because that is that's something special, and that's um, and it's just really I'm really happy that you came on the show. Well, thank you guys for allowing me to do that. You know, it, I do love you guys, and I've gotten so close to some of you, and you guys are like my kids. And if I can mm-hmm. help you, I'm here for you. You, I'm here. Call me anytime. That's awesome. Well, thank thank you, Dwayne, for coming on the show and uh, sharing. Yeah, absolutely. You're welcome. Thank you, Sylvia. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll we're going to stay in touch. We're still in that group, and uh, we've got the rest of the series to look forward to. Um, and ju- and like you, it's it's bittersweet. Uh, I, I'm glad they've I'm glad they were produced. They've produced this show, and and I think they're doing a, a really good job of telling the story. I think so too keeping it honest and keeping it real and everyone that I've talked to that's been, been in, in, the uh, in the city. Um, I just got off the phone last night with a guy who will be, I'll be releasing his show, I think next weekend. Uh, but he was, um, part of the, uh, first, uh, rescue team that went in to try to save the down, the, the, the platoon that was pinned down. Uh, he was in on the, on the, on the first wave uh, and took a lot of casualties. So um, he knows exactly um, what Robert went through. And there's uh, a lot of people that I talked to that have had. Who um, is it? Who did you? Who were you talking to? Jack Barron. Oh, okay. I don't think I've met him. He was a, a two-five guy. Um, special specialist at the time. He was a driver. Um, and uh, one of his gunners got hit and ended up moving into the gunning gunner's position. But um, yeah, he said the same thing. You know, that opening scene with the uh, with the casualties and and uh, the the section going in and taking fire. I mean, that's he says it was as accurate as, as he remembers. And it's uh, it, it's a good thing, but it's also it's tough, man. It's it's tough to see. It's tough to watch. Yeah, there there's a um, scene, you know, where uh, uh, Colonel Velasky is telling. Uh, Gosh, Thomas Young's mom, you know, mm-hmm. that he, he's yeah. going to bring everybody home. And I remember mm-hmm. the very first time I met him after they got back, after y'all got back, um, I went up to him and I hugged him and he started crying and he tells me, he says, I'm sorry. I'm like, for what? <laughs> he says, I'm sorry that I didn't bring him home. I said, but you did. You know, to me, it would have been worse if I wouldn't have been able to have him if he would have got lost out there or you know something terrible even worse than that and he's apologizing to me and i'm thinking he brought my son home 
he brought him home, and I was thankful. You know, I'd like to tell a uh, quick story. I have a, a friend of mine who was a, um, a guy that I used to work with who was an extra on the movie We Were Soldiers. And, uh, and he was there. A lot of the scenes um, were filmed on Fort Benning, and he was there when um, Colonel Hal Moore was giving the speech. Uh, um, there, the, the going away and said, we'll bring everyone home. But uh, General Moore, the actual General Moore, was on set that day, and, and many of them were gathered around him, uh, and, and tears were streaming down his face as he was listening uh, to, uh, to, to Mel Gibson reciting that. Uh, and, and he was saying, I couldn't, I didn't, I couldn't. Um, and, and this was decades after, um, yeah. I, I think the leaders, um, have a, uh, uh, all of us who are leaders have a burden. Eddie talked about it before. Um, you know, right. the, the one NCO that we lost, uh, I think at last count, there were probably 35 of us that felt that, that we were responsible for her death. Uh, and it's simply not true. Uh, not entirely true, not not even barely true, but um, no, and, and and it's it's common. And I understand that too, but I do I did want him, and I told him, you did bring my son home, not the way I wanted him, but you brought him home. Yeah. Well, well, Sylvia, again, thank you so much for again coming on the show and sharing your story. Yeah, you're you're part of the family now, so. You're not getting away. Yeah, you guys are stuck with me. Sorry. <laughs> All right. That's awesome. I'll talk to you guys later. All right. Thank you, Sylvia. Bye. Bye. She's got a lot of, lot of guts, man. That's all I can say. And, and, and it's hard to talk about because we don't talk about it. Uh, it's not mm -hmm. discussed. And uh, we don't um, have these conversations maybe the way we should. Um, you know, the, uh, the statistics are that, uh, uh, one in four, um, people within the last year have, uh, contemplated suicide. One in four, um, 25%. And, and I used to say this in, in any platoon, um, you know, uh, you've got five guys at any one time that, that thought about this in any company, you know, you, you have, you know, a, a huge number of people, but they don't know it. <clears throat> and, and if there were only some way that, and they don't all think about it at the same time, you know? And so it's not, you know, there's, there's times where, you know, one guy may be down and another, another guy may not be. And, and if there was only a way for, for us to be able to say, look, it's, it's common. I think a lot of it has to do with, um, people's knee jerk reactions. Um, I, I didn't get into suicide, it, it's not black or white. It's not on or off. It happens on a continuum. Uh, and so especially like uh, the active duty military, the, the minute the word sit comes out of somebody's mouth and then all of a sudden you've got, you know, um, everybody in around and putting them at a cot down at the CQ desk. And of course, who wants to? I mean, it's just the, the, the methods mm -hmm. that we use to intervene. Um, they keep someone safe, but they don't maintain dignity. Um, you know, we, right. we got to the point of, uh, we're not taking your weapon away from you, but we'll take your firing pin away. Um, uh, uh, when we were in country, if we had a, 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 you know, the chaplain or the doc says, Hey, you know, keep an eye, uh, that we still, you know, we, we just took your firing pin out and then, and then, you know, obviously the weapon wasn't effective and, but you weren't, um, the stigmatized of, uh, not carrying your weapon around. Uh, and so just different things like that, but mm. it's just, uh, uh, like, uh, like the guy said on, on one of my shows, it's a national problem with a local solution. And, uh, and hopefully, um, that message that Sylvia's message is going to get out, 